About ready to go. We will be joined by Dr. Kareen Chung in just one moment. We're going to be discussing fertility today. Okay. Let's get this started. All right, getting Dr. Kareen to join. Let's see here, perfect. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, good. How are you doing? Good. I'm okay. Yeah? It's been a, kind of an interesting time. It definitely has been an interesting time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Want to make sure you can hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. All right. Do you want to give a little intro about who you are and I can do the same just before we jump into everything? Sure. Um, so my name is Dr. Kareen Chung. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist. Um, been in practice for about 15 years. I'm at California Fertility Partners, which is in Brentwood. Um, I've been here for about a year. Previously, I was at USC Fertility for about 14 years. Um, and then moved my practice here because I really wanted to focus on taking care of patients. Um, at USC, I had a lot of um, different responsibilities, research, teaching, which I enjoy, but my true passion is taking care of patients. And so I've been able to do that mm -hmm. here and I'm really enjoying it. Um, I have areas of focus in my practice, um, mostly which include egg freezing, IVF, and then um, a special passion of mine for many years has been taking care of women who are diagnosed with cancer, um, who will be facing chemotherapy or other treatments that could affect their future ability to have children. And so I help them navigate mm -hmm. through the process of preserving their fertility um, before they face their cancer treatments. So that's me. Wow. That's amazing and such a need. Thank you. No. Um, and I'm excited to have you on. You and I met I don't know, some time ago, um, and both of our professions can in, like, get a little interwoven. Uh, <laughs> <times. do>. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'm a licensed acupuncturist, um, doc doctor of acupuncture and traditional oriental medicine. Um, although my focus is not fertility, uh, stress and lifestyle often is. And those are things that factor very much into fertility. Definitely. Um, so uh, what I'm really excited to talk about today is just kind of how everybody's adapting. Um, we've all made a lot of changes with patient care um, and how we're best able to pivot at this time. Um, are you still open? Uh, have you modified everything? How's that working? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's changing all the time. Um, but basically, as of March 17th, um, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine came out with um, a guidance document that basically stated that in the face of this pandemic that we're facing, um, fertility clinics basically should um, pause all fertility treatments um, that were not emergency fertility um, treatments such as cancer patients. So the cancer patients was the one exception to that guidance. Basically, um, what was said is that we could continue to offer fertility services for patients who are going to be freezing their eggs or embryos prior to chemotherapy, but all other fertility treatments should stop. And so that was on March 17th. Because of my focus um, clinically on cancer patients, I have continued to work throughout this whole time because I've had cancer patients that have needed to freeze their eggs and embryos before chemo. Um, and so our laboratory has continued to be open and our clinic has continued to be open, but the um, number of patients being seen is much, much lower than usual because um, all other fertility patients were basically asked um, to put their treatments on hold, which was very, um, difficult and emotional, as you could probably imagine, many of these um, couples have been trying to get pregnant for a long time and they, you know, 
finally felt, you know, some hope because they were going to begin treatment and they've been preparing their bodies to begin this treatment. And then all of the, all of a sudden being told that they had to wait um, and how long they had to wait, no one really knew. Um, but the reason for the guidelines was basically for two reasons. One is because, you know, at especially mid-March, we really had no idea what was going to happen with the this um, coronavirus pandemic, you know, how high were the cases going to spike, how many people were going to get really sick, how um, stressed was our healthcare system going to be specifically, you know, um, in LA, we didn't really know. Um, and so basically, the reason for the guidelines were to encourage people to stay home and stay safe, and also to minimize the utilization of medical resources, which, you know, at that time, the, were, the concern was that we were going to run out of personal protective equipment, um, gloves, masks, things that we need in, for, in a fertility clinic, but that um, the frontline workers were needing as well to take care of the COVID patients. So um, that was the reason for the guidelines. There was a lot of controversy, um, you know, a lot of emotions, um, just because, it, you know, it made it almost seem as though fertility treatment is elective, and no one thinks that fertility treatment is elective. It's, you know, it's a medical condition that needs treatment in many cases. And so um, in the last several weeks, there have been several updates to the um, guide guidelines. Um, the first update really didn't change much, but the most recent update, which was um, officially released on Monday, basically stated that we should all be making um, efforts to consider reopening, and the decision to reopen would be kind of um, allowed to be made, you know, um, by the individual clinics in a, in a way, you know, basically using our best judgment on how do we reopen safely, who do we allow to resume treatment because we don't necessarily want to reopen, you know, to everybody all of a sudden at the same time, because then that could potentially lead to um, too many people in the office at once and just lead to unsafe conditions. So basically what we've done is, you know, we have implemented a system that actually has been in place since March where we are screening our patients very um, thoroughly before they come into the office um, for any symptoms of the COVID-19 virus, you know, fever, aches, um, we take their temperatures before they come in and we limit the number of patients that we allow in the office at any given time. Um, usually, you know, in the mornings we have a packed waiting room, but during this time we basically have two patients in the office at any given time and they're always held far apart and everyone's wearing masks. So we've begun to allow treatments on a case-by-case -case basis, especially for the people who have the most time-sensitive cases, so patients who are older or um, maybe have evidence of diminished ovarian reserve or decreased egg quality, things that we know will get worse over time if um, patients are asked to continue to wait. And so that was a really long answer to your question. Um, so yes, we are open and we are opening more and more as time goes on. No, it's actually perfect because it addresses a couple of the other things I wanted to ask you. So we got a call with one answer. Um, the uh, whole thing about the essential health care is, like you said, it's, it's, it's difficult because it did make it seem like, oh, these are elective procedures. And no one thinks that. And that was the same thing with my practice. Um, I'm at less than a quarter of my usual capacity right now. And it's, you know, people who really, really need treatment. Um, so I'm not doing any cosmetic procedures. And not all cosmetic things that I do are elective. You know, a lot of scar work can be painful and debilitating. But it's about, like you said, limiting the exposure risk in office and still making sure that people are able to get quality care. You know, we didn't want um, people who were suffering chronic pain and acupuncture was really helping with to then have to go to an ER to seek out another option. So, you know, it's been a difficult transition time for everyone, but I'm so glad to hear that you all are still open and, you know, are starting to uh, figure out different ways to um, open up more procedures for patients um, and knowing that you know patients can have the confidence to come in and know that those things have been thought about and that they're going to be safe yeah yeah one of the things that we have not started yet but I hope to soon is um, uh, procedures that are actively intended to um, initiate a pregnancy right now. So things like intrauterine inseminations and embryo transfers, those things are still on hold. 
And the real reason for that, um, you know, aside from the two other reasons that I mentioned earlier that, you know, the ASRM wants us to enforce social distancing and minimize utilization of um, necessary health resources, but specifically with regard to treatments that are intended to initiate pregnancy like IUIs and embryo transfers. The concern is that we really don't know very much about the safety of pregnancy right now. Um, there's very little information about how COVID-19 affects women who are pregnant and their um, babies. Um, you know, there are there's some experience with other viruses in the past, like SARS and MERS and even the flu. Those viruses have been shown to in affect pregnant women much more severely than non-pregnant women. So for example, if you're pregnant and you get the flu, you'll get a much more severe version of that flu than a non-pregnant woman. So initially it was really unclear whether the same would be true for the COVID-19 virus. Based on the data that we have so far, most of it comes from China, which makes sense because they had, you know, they were probably the first in this whole um, pandemic. But basically what we know from those cases is that, you know, several hundred cases that have been studied of pregnant women who were diagnosed positive for COVID-19. And it seems like this virus does not affect pregnant women more severely than it affects non-pregnant women. So, so that's mm -hmm. good news. Um, you know, it kind of affects pregnant women the same way it's affecting everyone else, where there's a percentage of patients who, be, who become very severely ill, but then the large majority of patients, 90% or so, have a mild form of the illness, you know, fever um, and, and other symptoms like that. As far as the effects on the baby or on the pregnancy, you know, the large majority of these women who were, were diagnosed to be positive with the virus were diagnosed in the third trimester, so late in pregnancy. Um, you know, and that at that point, all the organs of the baby have already been formed. So, you know, the, the risk of uh, birth defects from an infection in the third trimester is, is really low. But um, so the outcomes that they've looked at is, you know, what about premature delivery or what about maternal deaths or neonatal deaths? And based on the several hundred cases that have been studied in China, um, there does not appear to be an increase in preterm labor or preterm delivery. There doesn't appear to be maternal or neonatal deaths um, due to this virus. So I think all of that is very encouraging. But again, we just don't know what happens if a patient is infected in the first trimester. Because in the first trimester, that's when all the critical organ formation in the baby is happening. And we know that things like really high fever in the first trimester can cause miscarriage and fetal loss. And so, you know, that's, that's the concern is if someone has an embryo transfer now and she's pregnant in her first trimester and then ends up becoming infected with this virus, that could cause her to lose the baby. It could cause... Um, malformations of the baby, we just don't know. So, you know, while most of the data that is out there is very reassuring, um, I think until we know a little bit more about how this virus may impact pregnant women if they're infected early in pregnancy, we, we need to proceed very cautiously as far as allowing patients to proceed with their embryo transfers. At the same time, you know, it's terrible to put people's you know, family planning goals on hold indefinitely. So, you know, and I have patients asking me every day, you know, even though they understand the risks and everything, when is a reasonable time to expect to be able to continue, you know, forward with their plans? And I, I feel like probably it's going to be like June, maybe July. So it's not going to be indefinite, but I think we have to just um, wait until there's a little bit more information about the safety of becoming pregnant right now. Yeah, and that's the questions I've been getting even from a natural pregnancy perspective um, without having to do any type of transfer. You know, patients have asked me or friends have asked me, like, what do we even know? Is this really the best time? Um, should I just wait? But, you know, June, July is not, is not far off. Um, it's not totally indefinite. And also, like you said, like we just need a little more data. There's no way, you know, it's easier to tell if someone's already been pregnant, you know, that decision was already made. And then, you know, to be able to do some testing and see how people are being affected at the end of a pregnancy. But like you mentioned, being in a high risk situation, um, or if you do have the option to wait a few months and just see, okay, well, what's, you know, going on with the situation here? Can we put this on hold? 
Um, it is frustrating, but if you have the option to just be safe and wait a few months, I think that's that's a, a great way to go. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of the like the the side effects of the situation happening. So patients that didn't suffer from chronic stress in the past are really stressed right now. Um, and some of those things I'm also concerned about, you know, that contributes to fertility as well and your ability to conceive as well. So um, are you recommending anything for people at home at this point, um, if they're, you know, they know in the next six months they want to try to get pregnant or, you know, if they did already have an active fertility plan with you, um, anything that you're saying, okay, well, this needs to continue while you're at home. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And I think it's important to give people tools right now to feel empowered to um, to do something about their fertility since they're being asked to, you know, stay at home and wait. Um, you know, but one thing I just want to clarify real quick is that even if we do resume embryo transfers in June, July, you know, I think everybody knows that this virus, unfortunately, is probably not going to be gone in a couple of months, you know, so those women who are pregnant either naturally or due to um, or, or from fertility treatments, once they are pregnant, I think it's super important that they just do everything they can to stay safe, you know, um, and that includes staying home, staying protected, washing hands, avoiding contact with people who might be infected and all that stuff. And so, you know, people have not been told that they shouldn't try to get pregnant naturally at home. There's no guidance that says you can't, you know, people who want to try naturally can't. Um, but I think that's just an important take home message is that if you do become pregnant, because we don't know about what the effect of this virus is on early pregnancy, just be very careful to, you know, protect yourself. But as far as things that um, people can do while they're home to optimize their fertility, I think, you know, a lot of the things that we can do to try to optimize a person's body for fertility and reduce stress um, are things that they can work at, at on at home you know, even in this shelter in place. So, and a lot of them are healthy choices that kind of make sense, I think, for general health. But the things that I tell my patients are, you know, as far as food choices, you know, so I think a lot of people are always asking, oh, is there a special fertility diet that I should follow that will help me get pregnant? And I wish there were, I wish there were a magic um, diet that would work for everybody. But I think the one that has been shown to probably be best for fertility also is probably best for general health. And so I recommend for my patients, the Mediterranean diet, which basically includes, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables, nuts, fishes, beans, whole grains, uh, moderate amounts of like chicken and dairy and eggs, but um, minimal amounts of red meat and try to avoid any processed foods or things with a lot of artificial sugars. Um, a lot of fertility conditions do kind of involve inflammation, as you know. Um, right. And so I usually um, tell my patients, you know, especially women with endometriosis, um, foods that are rich in antioxidants have an anti-inflammatory effect. So it doesn't hurt and it may help to, to eat a little bit more of those antioxidant rich foods. So blueberries, raspberries, dark chocolate. I mean, who doesn't want to eat that? I would eat that all day, <laughs> um, but you don't actually want to eat it all day. But, but generally I, those I think are good food choices just to kind of enhance your diet. Um, kale, spinach, you know, those are all antioxidant rich foods. Um, other things that, you know, people can be working on at this time is um, trying to cut out things that they may be doing that might not be good for their fertility. For example, cigarette smoking. And it's not easy to quit cigarette smoking, and that includes vaping. Um, and so if you're being asked to wait to get pregnant and it's going to be a two to three month period of time, that should be a good amount of time to really set your goals towards completely eliminating any cigarette smoking or vaping by the end of that, that waiting period. Um, we know that cigarette smoking causes um, effects on ovarian reserve and egg quality. And so um, that's definitely something that if you, if you know, if, if my patients are smoking, I really emphasize that they should stop that habit. Caffeine, um, excessive amounts of caffeine have been shown to be associated with increased risk for miscarriage. So one cup a day of caffeine is what is, um, is recommended or, you know, is the maximum amount that's recommended. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that's another thing that sometimes can take some time to, to wean off of if you're used to drinking four or five cup, cups of coffee per day, then, you know, mm -hmm. trying to decrease it to one cup a day would be great. 
um, moderate exercise regularly. Um, I know that you're a big exercise uh, yeah. fan, as am I. So I, you know, and I think that people get a lot of mixed advice from friends and family members. You know, I've seen a lot of patients who were told that um, once they want to try to get pregnant, they should stop exercising. But that's actually not true. So, you know, um, exercise is good for your general health. It's good for stress relief. Um, it's good to maintain optimal weight. And all those things are good for fertility. So what I recommend for exercise is a moderate exercise routine 